Hey guys, just to let you know, this story is from the official Wizards of the Coast Icewind Dale Rhyme of the Frost Maiden campaign. So if you're playing it or you're planning on playing it in the future, be warned because there is spoilers. So just letting you know. <laughs> Let's get into the video. Icewind Deal. Giant Slayer's best bits. Hey. My Icewind Deal game has been going strong for a few months now, and I've pulled together some of the funnier stories from that campaign thus far. These are the Goblinoid Giant Slayer's best bits. Chapters 3 to 8. Oh, we put quite a bit together. We're, we're on session 10, by the way, guys. Just seeing so you know. Through a contrived series of events I won't recount, I wind up on a 5th edition Spelljammer server, which also happened to be the stomping grounds of a certain green text YouTuber, and started running an Icewind Deal game there. This is the ongoing story of a band of savage cannibals trying, not very hard, to be heroes, and a GM trying to make sense of it all. <laughs> That's like really nice. Like, okay, look, we're, we're not heroes, guys, okay? We're really not. Uh, I'm just going to shut up for most of this. Yeah. Uh, because I know what happens. I don't want to spoil anything. It's a good story, yeah. so let's just get into this. Fuck off, Neckbeard, yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Look, I, I, t I told you I would. Be me, GM. Relatively new to 5th edition. First time running Wizards of the Coast module. Every session of this game deals psychic <laughs> <laughs> yeah, after that last one, I believe it did. <laughs> but again, guys, you just have to wait and see. Be not me. Eivar the human illusionist wizard. A creepy Rasputin looking motherfucker. Which is James. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm actually enchantment, just saying. Elton John, the goblin celestial chain warlock. Fabulous master of disguise. Neddy El Yeti, the bugbear arctic druid. A frost maiden worshipper and a double <laughs> simp. <laughs> I forgot about that. Orc, the half-orc zealot barbarian, pisses on everything. Stugok, bugbear rogue, gets way too many crits. Interlude, the WWE and the druids masochism fetish. After slaying the giants in Goodmead and earning their name, the party went to the lodge of a frost giant, saved some children, killed the mammoth and one of the winter wolves inside and returned the kids to their inbred town. That night they had prophetic dreams, which they mostly joked about. They sold the weird metal they got from the giants in Bryn Shander. They stole it back to sell elsewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it's a solid <laughs> moneymaker, guys, okay? As Stugok and Elton John were invisibly perpetuating the scheme, they saw another pair of footprints in the snow, being made by invisible creatures. They followed the footprints the next day, but lost the trail only knowing they went in the direction of the Lone Mountain, Kelvin's Carn. Turns out a lot of things went missing that night, and the party was never blamed. <laughs> Later, as they were searching for clues on the murders, some party members think their frost maiden worshipping druid is secretly responsible. Hey, it would have made a lot of sense if it was him though. It would have made a lot of sense. They were recruiting into the Deal Wrestling Federation by halfling Ron Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> he had that big pedo stash and all. Orc got his ass beat for going off script, and Ned got his ass handed to him by a Goliath woman he immediately fell in love with. Where the double sim comes in. That time with the creepy patron and the dinosaur. The party wandered into the town of Bremen, where they were meeting up with their patron, the wizard Dazam. They had been tasked with finding and capturing an elemental spirit called Chewenga. They had succeeded, but there was a problem. It was unbearably cute. Like, it was really adorable. And I had a little fox in it. Like, it was really nice. <laughs> and the party was on edge with what the wizard wanted with the Chewinka and what he was going to do with it. They knocked on his door and were greeted by a tall, bulky woman with bright red hair, followed by a posse of adventurers who were on their way out. The Zan let them in. The building was broken down but magically air conditioned with an animated broomstick cleaning up what the party dragged in. His bodyguard, Vitala, was covered from head to toe in furs and hadn't said a word. The Chewinga, half a foot tall and utterly innocent, looked nervously about. Dizan smiled and crouched down, playing with the little spirit until it let him touch it. Then it crumpled into the ground. The party damn near exploded. Dizan explained that he had only put it to sleep and needed it to study the deal's natural magic or some such. Still, the party was getting bad vibes from the wizard. 
even as he paid them. He swiftly gave them another job. The local fishermen had been reporting attacks by a lake monster, and if the party could observe and get information on the beast, there'd be a reward on it. The party returned some hours later, having established contact with an evil frost maiden worshipping dinosaur, they dubbed it Nessie, <laughs> which had been awakened by a frost druid near the town of Lonelywood. With another frost druid in their party, the creature had spared them, and the party had approved of its mission to terrorise the local fishermen in the rural's name. However, they had taken no notes, and weren't willing to give any real info on their new friend. The Zan facepalmed, paid them a pittance, and gave them another mission they might not fuck up. Look, the guy had just been very mean to our nice wee pet Tringa. <laughs> he asked us then to go investigate, and Nessie was, seemed like a cool guy. So we weren't going to tight on him to fucking Dazan, because <laughs> Dazan can go fuck himself. How does that sound, guys? Don't fuck with my little pet, the pets, okay? I mean, but, like, I'll be cool to everything else, but don't fuck with my little adorable pets, all right? <laughs> there was an old structure atop of the mountain of Calvin's Cairn, ancient and little studied. Dazan charged them with summiting the mountain, gaining ingress to the structure if they could, and taking extensive notes. The party accepted the job left and immediately talk shit about him <laughs> <laughs> that time the wizard almost fell into the underdark and licked magic this is where it went really downhill for me guys <laughs> just after this bit the party took a job to clear out kobolds from a gem mine in tourmaline this was routine there was one infestation or another every few months owing to the pit into the underdark that just happened to be there they surreptitiously bought some pickaxes to mine their own gems while inside, and after some exploration, they discovered the pit. It was huge, and past attempts to fill it had just made a dent. So of course, Orc decided to jump down the pit into the lower layer of the mine. And of course he slipped, and Elton John had to use Eldritch Blast to push him onto a platform, where he came face to face with a mob of kobolds. As the party rushed to find a way to the lower level, Orc had a surprisingly good chat with the kobolds. Their leader, Trex, was just looking for a new home for his people, and spoke common better than Orc. The party soon re-established contact, and they made a deal. If the kobolds mine some gems for them on the sly, they'll pitch a peace <laughs> they'll pitch a peaceful interrogation to the mayor. Without any need to fight, the party got down to mining. Eivar jumped in a pulley carriage to check out the other side of the pit. And that's where everything went to shit. A huge brain with an owl-like beak and tentacles appeared out of the darkness above Avar as he was halfway across. The cry went up and Avar managed to get to the other side but was hit and paralysed by the monster. Stugok filled it with arrows and the spellcaster did their best to bring it down. Orc was just yelling incoherently as he had no ranged options until he handed a spear to Chuck. The Grell was nearly dead, but was hovering over the pit and descending. If they killed it, Avar would fall to his death. If they left it alive, it would drag Avar to the depths and eat him. Orc did the only logical thing. He jumped into the pit again, into the Grell, and killed it, and jumped to the side, holding onto the wall. Then Elton John activated a stone of animal conjuring, and two giant eagles manifested, catching Avar and helping the two back to safety. Finally getting to investigate the other side of the pit, Avar found a skull with massive eye holes and a few pits where teeth should have been, fused into the stone. He broke it out of the wall and cracked it open. Inside the skull was a brilliant crystal. Those were the remains of a mind flare, and the crystal was a fossilised brain. Of course, Avar decided to lick it. Look, look, look. It wasn't like, I, okay, okay. Like, Teal is the guy. Like, so Nettie, we asked the druid, like, what do you think of this? This is more of a nature thing. He's like, I don't know, it was in his head, so why do you put it in your head? So I decided to put it on my tongue, putting it in my head. You know, I'm pretty sure Nettie wanted to, like, you know, put my head on the side and just start, like, pounding it into the side of my head, but look. I, you licked it? Okay. I, well, I didn't lick it, I put it in my you mouth. Licked it. it didn't really work out too good. <laughs> Ever decided to lick it. Ever since then, he hears scrambled, staticky voices from the heavens. Yeah, like this. Red like, leader, like, red <laughs> leader, I'm going down. 
like it, it, it went really partly okay I was okay like at that moment whenever I was going down into the big hole I was wanting it to be like you know like maybe Lord of the Rings with Balrog and I like show up like three sessions later we're like up a few levels like <laughs> kill new gear and shit you know oh, but, so he's driven to drink <laughs> yeah interlude wanted dwarf the party successfully integrated the kobolds into the town but the kobold leader suddenly lost his superior intelligence the party thought it might have something to do with the threadbare pouch the mare stole but elton john got caught when trying to investigate his alter ego douglas dwarf is now wanted for thievery and assaulting the mare <laughs> we did also blame douglas dwarf for the whole um metal selling scam that we were on oh, so you know <laughs> hey guys do you like models in your tabletop role-playing games because we do too do you like having big bitty waifus on your table? Because we do too. <laughs> <laughs> we got human biddies. We got lizard biddies. We got orc biddies, oni biddies, cat bussies. We've got everything you want at neckbeardia.co.uk. <laughs> Check the links down below. It helps us out a lot. Sorry for interrupting the video. Let's get on the story. That time with all the exposition. The party took on a job to track and kill a murderous white moose in the town of Lonelywood. Beyond the money, Ned's druid circle said that a rogue frost druid had been awakening animals left and right and their conversation with Nessie confirmed it. They ran into Stepheck, a bounty hunter from the first session, and got lodgings with the town speaker who tried to pay them in cookies until they insisted on cash. In the speaker's home, they also met an elderly woman with an eye patch. She introduced herself as Velen Harple and started asking the party a bunch of strange questions. If they had seen an albino tiefling or a design, whom she described perfectly and told the party not to trust. The party just moved on. They tracked the moose through the woods to a hidden elven tomb filled with wind-worn statues and an outdoor sarcophagus the party couldn't open. Further inside, they find and slew the moose. Inside its lair, the party found a huge magic mirror which can answer seven questions. The party confers among themselves and each ask a personal question. Stugok asks how to get his friend Roderick out of prison. The mirror shows him a vision of a fortified prison to the north, then pans to the city of Bryn Shander, to the town hall, and the speaker, Devesa Sheen. Elton John asks what made Orc the way he is. <laughs> and why he pisses on everything. And why he's so angry all the time. Who hurt you, Orc? Who hurt you? <laughs> the mirror shows him Orc's stepfather in the Three Arrows tribe, who in that moment is mussing about how he doesn't miss Orc at all. From then on, the warlock frequently uses Mask of Many Faces onto Orc's stepdad to make him think he's hallucinating. It's pretty funny, so it is. Orc asks who's the biggest asshole in the deal, so he can kill it. The mirror pans north across the tundra, across the sea of moving ice to an island, and upon the island is a giant sized fortress in the shape of a skull, and inside the fortress, Orc catches only a glimpse of a humanoid creature with the head of an owl, before the figure turns to stare at the divination, and the vision ends. Oh shit, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got seen, we got spooked. Eivor asks what the wizard Dizan is planning. They see his place in East Haven and a few of his overturned notes. They make out a few words, including Matharla, which Eivor thinks is some kind of crystal ball. Ned asks to see Jelavikin, the giant druid he wants to make a pilgrimage to meet. They see a near-naked frost giant meditating in the centre of a circle of stone thrones. They ask about the closest mind flares, and the mirror surprised them by showing them a nautiloid flying far above them, instead of the Underdark. After a few more turns, the party realises they've forgotten the most obvious question. Who is the serial killer haunting ten times? The mirror pans a short distance, showing the figure of Stepheck, the bounty hunter, moving towards the tomb the party is inside. They set an ambush for him, but quickly find they'd misjudged the situation. He could pull blades of ice from the air itself, teleported, regenerated his wounds, and very nearly killed a couple of party members. Still, they took him down. But even as his body fell, the bright blue went out of his eyes, and a wispy spirit rose from his corpse, cursed the party, and flew away. Further inside the tomb, the party discovered the rogue druid, 
and quickly dogpiled on her. That left only the sarcophagus outside, which could only be opened with a ritual that required a human hand. Luckily, they had those for days, chopping off the druid's hand and burning it with pine needles and feathers. The sarcophagus opened. Inside was a mummy, which, to their surprise, was friendly and willing to travel with him. She was actually quite nice. <laughs> they returned to Lonelywood to find people screaming and running. Apparently, a logger had just gone crazy and chopped up several people, yelling about the will of the Frost Maiden. They soon came face to face with Velen, who seemed too ready to know what was happening. Let me guess. The serial killer that's been hunting ten times was possessed by an evil spirit, which just now had its cover blown, and now it's killing random people for the hell of it. Luckily, the party brought back Step Hex's body, which Velen took, and promised to exorcise the spirit. Later that night, the party was disturbed by a piercing scream from her hut, but when they arrived, she shooed them away impatiently. At least there weren't any more murderers after that. I don't know. I'm still kind of sceptical whether or not that evil spirit has got a new body and is just lying low for the meantime. <laughs> that time with the Yeti and the anti-air cannon. Yeah, ah. yeah, we got we found an anti-aircraft gun. <laughs> it's pretty beast. After the last fiasco, the party decided to actually follow up on their job and investigate the mountain of Kelvin's Carn. They made their way across the tundra, the lone peak looming dark in the front of the moon. When they finally reached the base, they spotted a wolf, no, a dog, charging the party. It launched at Avar, almost knocking him to the ground, and desperately licked his face. He was a very sweet boy. It was a sled dog, trilling a broken harness. Its collar identified it as a boy, property of Frozen Far Expeditions. It whimpered and urged the party towards the mountain. It led them to an abandoned base camp with the rest of the miserable dogs. The party fed and petted them and began their own ascent. Because you've got to feed the doggos. You've got to feed the doggos. You've got to give them lots of patterns. And lots like, of it's foods. okay. Yes. Have some food. We have plenty of polar bears still. Ned shifted into the shape of a mountain goat and Elton John rode atop of him. <laughs> Black <laughs> I never got through that. Yeah, actually it is Black Adder. They passed by another goat herd, undisturbed, had to deal with a couple of party members getting caught in an avalanche, and soon found the body of one of the climbers, lying half-conscious in the snow. That was when they got jumped by massive crag cats, which they drove off, Elton John riding atop his horned steed. His name was Garrett, a mountaineer and a local tour guide hired by a party of three adventurers to reach the top of the mountain. They were looking for... Uh, Oi, Yamanar talk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what you're getting, boys. I'm sorry, I can't even remember how to say it. A legendary werebear said to grant her curse to those strong enough to best her in an honourable combat. Yeah, this is where we were really tempted to all become furries. <laughs> what? Because <laughs> like, being werebears would be pretty cool. But then again, we actually thought about it for five seconds, like, oh wait, no, we become furries, and wouldn't we? <laughs> but being werebers, like the old werebear party, would be pretty baller, though, wouldn't it? <laughs> Unfortunately, they ran into a yeti instead. It twisted the glass head off its neck. The party's tiefling ran up the mountain. The halfling tried to hide in the yeti's cave, and Garrett made the only sane decision by running back down, chased by the yeti until he lost it, but fell exhausted into the snow. After a little patching up, he agreed to help the party climb up and hopefully rescue the survivors. The rest of the climb was exhausting, and though they located the Yeti's cave, they elected to pass it by, reach the summit and camp there to overcome some of their exhaustion before tangling with one of those monsters. Ever since the debacle in the gen mine, Eivar has been dealing with voices in his head, most of which he can't understand. Those voices only became louder and clearer as he climbed the mountain. The party finally summited. The structure that Dazan spoke of was built into the rock, dome-shaped, with no visible entrances. If there was a way in, it wasn't up here. They also found the party tiefling frozen solid. Her spell book was fine though. Yeah, that was getting screwed. <laughs> As the party lay down to rest in an igloo atop the tallest mountain for miles, Avar took in the view outside. The voices drew in his gaze to the sky, to a star. A comet? No, a ship, dropping out of the sky and coming towards him, its comms chatter clear as crystal. Then a flash of light and a boom shattered the air. It came from the doomed structure right behind Avar, 
and the beam struck the ship mid-flight. It caught flame, and the newly awake party saw it crash into the mountain far to the south. What the fuck? The next morning, they agreed to head out to the site of the crash landing after this job was done. They descended the mountain and arrived at the Yeti's cave. Stugok scouted within and found a strange sight. Through the winding passage, beyond the skull trophies, including the Goliath and Dwarf from Season 1, he saw a mother Yeti and her cub playing, passing a ball from one to another. It just so happened that the ball was a halfling, terrified, exhausted, and curled up in the fetal position. Stugok motioned the party in, and they struck. They made quick work of the Yeti mother, and captured the cub while Elton John and Garrett helped the halfling, named Perilu, and inside the cave was a passage which led further up into the mountain. Between Ned's intimate knowledge of Yetis, and Orc's pure intimidation factor, they kept the cub pacified, and dragged it along with them. At the end of the passage, they found a great domed room, with a huge magic technical contraption hanging from the ceiling. They poked around with it, figuring they could interact with the weird bull at the head. Sticking their head inside, they could actually see outside of the mountain. Not just that, they could see for miles in every direction. They could literally see their in from there. There were even a few little dots in the centre of their vision. Out of game, the party connected the dots immediately. It was a targeting reticle. A targeting reticle for an automated anti-air cannon that had been there for thousands of years. Still worked perfectly, and looked like it had a couple of shots left in it. They pondered at the possibilities as their mages looked it over, and figured out its functioning. Although they didn't test it, they were soon interrupted by the bull yeti, screaming at the murder of its partner, and the kidnapping of its child. The party had no mercy. Having discovered a very valuable destructive device, which they were absolutely not going to tell the wizard about, a murdered yeti's cub's parents in front of it, they descended the mountain, got Perley, Garrett, and the sled dogs back to safety in Kerconic. They started hearing rumours about missing items, thieving dwarves, and planned to visit the spaceship's crash site. But that's a story for another day. This is where it really gets into it, though. See that shitting down of the spaceship? Mm. It really gets into it. And the problem is, I don't really want to say too much while we're recording because I'm just going to spoil for you guys. So, you know, <laughs> I don't really like saying it. But yeah, if you guys are enjoying this, I'm, I'm really enjoying this campaign so far. It's the first um, official Wizards of the Coast campaign I've played in a very long time. So it's actually quite fresh and it's quite nice and I'm, I'm actually really enjoying it. I think mm-hmm. it's pretty cool. But if you enjoy listening to it, let us know down below yeah. and we'll keep doing, doing this. this for you so you the, get the hear The other reference. thing is also because we've decided instead of, like, this is a problem I've got with a lot of like story times we do, like think the old skeleton party and stuff, it gets bogged down mm-hmm. and it's very hit for hit everything mm-hmm. whereas this is a very, like you know every, It's your best bit. This is genuinely best bits like that, what, what's happened in this is over the course of like six sessions yeah. you know, and we don't really want to get bogged down, we want to get the story out to you guys, tell you what are going on but we don't want to make it like 50 million yeah. parts yeah. and then it just gets bogged down it never goes anywhere and it gets bored and people just stop watching you know what I mean you get what I'm trying to say but like if you guys enjoy this one definitely let us know about it it's a lot of fun I'm really enjoying playing it and really nice just to be in one of these stories for a change <laughs> yeah. you know so I I, I'm, I I think this is really cool and I hope you guys are enjoying it as much as I am yes but give the video a like hit subscribe hit the notification bell so you get notified every time we post check out the links to the website to see our models and all the subclasses and t-shirts and stuff and we'll see you in the next video bye <laughs>